In front of me here, I have the most popular battery powered photography strobes currently on the market. I put these strobes through the most detailed tests I've ever done before so that we can figure out which one is best for you. Let's get to it. I've got all these lights set up from cheapest to most expensive, starting over here with the newer Q4. Next up, Westcott FJ400 for $599. Next, we have the Godox 8400 Pro for $649. Then we have the 8600 Pro at $799. Now, I started this entire test and then Godox decided to release the 8600 Pro 2 for $899. So I had to restart the entire review. Next up, we have the very small Profoto B10X for a staggering $1,800. Next up, we have the Profoto B10X Plus, which is slightly larger and more powerful for $2,200. And finally, we have the gigantic Braun Color Cirrus 800L for $2,800. Now there's a massive difference in price range here and there should also be a massive difference in power output. So let's go ahead and start with the power output test. The easiest way for me to show this is to start with the cheapest light and give it a power rating of zero. The Westcott was three tenths of a stop dimmer. The 8400 was the exact same power rating. The 8600 and the 8600 II were four tenths of a stop brighter. The Profoto B10X was the dimmest at eight tenths of a stop dimmer. The Profoto B10X Plus was one tenth of a stop brighter than the newer, and the Braun color was the brightest at six tenths of a stop brighter than the newer flash. What I took away from this test is that the power output difference between these flashes is not nearly as significant as I was expecting. The biggest difference is between the Profoto B10X and the Braun color we're getting a difference of about 1.4 stops. But when we compare the Braun color to the much more affordable Godox 8600, we are only two tenths of a stop away from each other. Next up, let's talk build quality and we'll start with the cheapest, newer Q4 light. Surprisingly, this thing feels pretty good, uh, especially for the price. I was expecting it to be much cheaper feeling. The battery slides into the side here. You will notice the strange shape of this light, which I'm not sure I'm a huge fan of, but it's certainly not a deal breaker. It's just a little different. The buttons on the back by no means feel amazing, but for 300 bucks, I mean, this is pretty impressive. Next up, the Westcott FJ400. This light is significantly heavier and larger than the other lights, and it doesn't feel quite as high quality to me. The plastic just feels a little bit cheaper. The buttons feel okay, but you know, it's not gonna blow you away by any means. But again, for the price, I feel like it's okay build quality. Next up, we have the three Godox lights here, and I would say we have a nice upgrade in build quality compared to the previous two lights with each of these lights. They all feel very similar. We have screens on the side. These are the old school backlit LED screens. When you press a button, they kind of uh, light up from the back. We have a color screen on the new 8600 Pro 2 here. The buttons on these, again, just feel okay. I wouldn't say they're gonna blow you away by any means. They just feel okay. I think Godox could upgrade the quality of those buttons just a little bit, or just move over completely to a color touchscreen. I think that would be probably the easiest and fastest, but we're not quite there yet. Next up, we've got the Profoto lights, and it's probably no surprise that these are the king of build quality. They're by far the smallest, so that's gonna be much more convenient to move them around. They also just feel so much more compact. Some of these other lights, when you pick them up, they kind of feel like there's a lot of wasted space because they're hollow inside, maybe for cooling. It feels like there's no wasted space in these lights. I love how compact and small they are. I love that the battery slides into the side here so that the screen can fit on the back. And then these buttons feel significantly better than any of the other lights. It's hard to convey this on camera, but I'm telling you just using this light and feeling it, it feels like a premium product for sure. All right, now it's time for the Mac Daddy, the Braun Color Cirrus L. This light is very strange. It kind of feels like the future, if the future was like 1993. Uh, as you can tell, this thing is gigantic. It's also the only one, I believe, that's made completely of metal, which you might say, ooh, that's nice and premium, but it also scratches really easily. I haven't been using these very long, but I can see scratches on it already. There's a big one right there. So having it be painted metal may not look good for long. The battery slides into the top here and there's this weird cheesy spring. It just doesn't feel very high quality. And you turn it on 
with this switch on the bottom here. And then instead of a screw, oh, I don't even have the battery in all the way. And instead of an LCD screen, it's got this super old analog system here with lights, lighting options up. Uh, I don't wanna say that this flash has poor build quality. It just kind of feels like an antique to me. It doesn't really feel like modern electronics. And so I feel like Braun Color could probably update this, shave off one third of the size, add a color screen to it, and uh, it could be a really nice product. But this flash is very old. It hasn't been updated in a long time and I can feel and see that very easily. Next up, let's talk user interface. What's it actually like to use and control and change the settings on each one of these flashes? Starting with the newer, it has a power button right here, rotate to unlock. You can change the power of the flash by rotating this knob here. The knob doesn't feel like super high quality, but it works and it's pretty quick to do it. I don't think you're gonna be blown away by the user experience of this flash. However, if you're a photographer, you're used to using strobes like this, you're gonna be able to instantly figure it out without going into the manual. And so for me, that's a win. For the Westcott FJ400, I personally find the user interface to be slightly more confusing than the previous light. Although it does have the color screen, instead of having buttons that do individual things, you'll notice that these buttons correlate to what the color screen says on the left. And then as you press these buttons, it's changing the options below. I personally find that confusing and a little bit slower to use than if there was an individual menu button. I don't think it's a deal breaker and I don't think the average photographer is gonna have too much trouble figuring it out. You probably also don't need to go uh, reading the manual to use it. It's just not quite as quick to me personally. And I was also a little bummed out to see that it doesn't have the color touchscreen that Westcott's Speedlight has because that was one of the easiest flashes I've ever used because you could literally touch exactly what you wanted and change it right there. So this is not my favorite, but it works. All of the Godox lights have a very similar setup with buttons on the screen. Obviously the new one has the color screen here, but the way you navigate is very similar. Rotate this knob to change the power output of the light. You can hit the mode button to switch between TTL, multi-mode or manual mode, and hit the menu button and scroll through to change different settings and then press the set button in the middle there. Again, super straightforward. I like it. Although I think it could be better if it was just a color touchscreen. I think this is super quick and any photographer is gonna be able to figure it out instantly. Now, many of you watching will probably prefer Godox user interface. I personally prefer Pro Photos. I love how simple the back is here. We have just three buttons and two of these can twist. If I hold this button here, it will turn on. And then I can press this button in to go to the menu. I rotate it to choose what I want. I press it to make a change. And then I can change the power output in one tenth of a stop increments by turning this knob here, or I can press it in and change it by full stops. This button here will turn on the modeling light. I can twist it to change the power, and then I can push it in and twist it to change the color of this light. Now again, some of you might not like that these buttons aren't labeled, but being that there's only three, and maybe it's because I'm used to Profoto, I just feel like this is the slickest, easiest light I've ever used. Now the Braun Color on the other hand has one of the worst user interfaces of all of these lights. And it's also one of the simplest, but I just didn't know what a lot of this stuff meant. You can see mod, I wasn't sure what that meant, but then I learned that that is the modeling light. So that turns it on and off. Eco, I don't even know what that is. I'm probably gonna have to go back in the manual and read that. If you press this button down here, you can rotate through these different settings and it lights these up, but then it just writes these weird letters on the screen and I'm not sure what a lot of these mean. And so I kept finding myself having to go back into the manual again and again and again to read like what the heck is CE. So in terms of user interface and ease of use, this is the worst in my opinion. Now let's talk about light quality or the shape of the light produced by each one of these flashes. The Profoto lights are the only one in this group that have a permanent internal flash tube, which means that the flash tube is recessed all the time. I cannot get the flash tube out of this. I personally don't find that to be a big deal, but most photographers or many photographers do. And all of the other flashes come with a reflector dish that is removable and you'll notice that the flash tube is now exposed. And many photographers say that they prefer this because 
an exposed flash tube lights up modifiers, especially softboxes, more evenly. That being said, never once in my entire 20 year photography career have I found that my softboxes have not been evenly lit without an exposed flash tube. It just isn't a big deal to me. So I did a test comparing the shape of the light from each one of these flashes with their included reflector dishes on, and in the case of Profoto, no modifier at all. And you'll notice that the newer Westcott and Godox lights have a very ugly shape out of their reflector dishes. But the Profoto lights and the Braun color light looks fantastic. So maybe in this test, you could say that Braun color is the winner because it has the best of both worlds. With the included reflector dish, it has a nice smooth fall off on the edge of the light. And you can take that reflector dish off and you can get that exposed flash tube to light up all of your modifiers as evenly as possible. Next, let's talk modifiers. How do you actually get some sort of modifier to stay on these lights. The newer Westcott and Godox lights all use a standard Bowens mount. They each have some sort of locking mechanism on the side, you push down, rotate, and the modifier comes off. The problem with the Godox 400 is that this flash is so small, it can't natively hold a Bowens mount. So what you have to do is take off the reflector dish that comes with it. You then add on a Bowens mount adapter that is included with this flash, but it's just kind of a pain in the butt to have to keep up with that. And then you can attach different modifiers to that modifier. The larger 8600 does not have that problem. This is a standard Bowens mount. Again, push this down, rotate, pull off. And so any standard Bowens mount will fit onto this. Now, Profoto has its own mounting system that seems cheaper and worse until you use it, and then you don't really wanna go back to Bowen. So they just have this friction mount. It's just uh, rubber here. This slides onto all of their flashes, and then this friction switch here locks it down on the head. It's very strong. I personally like this because, especially if you're using really heavy modifiers, Having to fit the little teeth in to the Bowens mount is very difficult. And so I just find this mount to be a lot easier and more reliable for me personally. But if you already have speed rings for Bowens lights, you probably prefer that. Now, I think all of these other light manufacturers messed up because what they should have done is they should have made their reflector dishes the exact same circumference as Profoto lights. And then they could have worked with Profoto gear or Bowens gear. Let me show you what I mean. You can see how close this is, but it doesn't fit. You can see how close this is, but it just barely doesn't fit. And so if they had made it the same size, you could choose to use Profoto gear or the Bowens mount. Uh, but man, I feel like they really missed out there. Finally, we have Braun Color's own proprietary locking system. Instead of Bowens system that has four, this has just two nuts that fit into place right here. And I do not like how flimsy this is at all. It just kind of rotates freely around and it rattles and stuff. It just feels really cheap to me. And so in my opinion, this is a clear loss. I do not like Braun Color System at all. Now let's get real nerdy and talk about color accuracy. This first chart we have up here is the Kelvin temperature accuracy, which is going to measure our white balance, which is our orange to blue shift. And then this second chart down here is our CCI test, which is going to measure our magenta to green shift. Now, all of these flashes have a freeze mode and a normal or color mode, except for the newer. The newer just has one standard flash mode. Now, freeze mode will give you faster flash duration, which we will test in one second, but it's going to mess with colors a little bit more. And then in normal mode or in color mode, you're going to get better, more accurate color but you're going to have a longer flash duration. So if you look down here along the bottom for the total difference, we're looking for the smallest number, and that happens to be the Profoto B10X at 142 Kelvin shift, which is the least color shift, which means it is the most color accurate. Now, you'll notice that there's a second number down here as well. That's because the Profoto B10 has two extra stops than almost all the other lights. You'll also notice that the Godox 8602, the new version, has one additional stop of power on the low end, not on the high end. But when you compare it with the older 8600, it has one lower power option as well. 
Now, Westcott got second place with 155. The Profoto B10X Plus got third place with 194. And Godox did really well at 212, 202, and 230. You will notice here, the newer version, the Godox 8602, has three different shooting modes. It's the only flash that has three. So it has a normal mode, a color mode, and a freeze mode. And as we would expect, the color mode has the most accurate color at a color shift of 230. Moving down to our CCI test here, you'll notice that it is a tie between the Profoto B10X Plus with a color shift of 0.1. Again, we have another option here of 0.2 if you wanna consider the uh, extended range that it has. And we have the Westcott FJ400 with a color shift of 0.1 as well. So it's clear that Profoto and Westcott have the most accurate colors in normal mode, however, Take a look at how interesting this is. If we look at the freeze mode on Westcott, the colors get crazy, 1245 Kelvin shift. When we go over to the Pro Photo, we've got a 2300 shift and a 2600 Kelvin shift. Huge color range difference. Same thing happens in our CCI test. The Westcott in freeze mode shifts 0.6 and the Pro Photo shift 0.7. Look at how color accurate the Godox flashes are in freeze mode. 347, 528, and 551. So this is really interesting because somehow Godox is able to give us extremely fast flash durations, which we'll look at next, while keeping very accurate color. So depending on what type of photography you do, if you're doing lots of ultra fast photography, maybe studio splash photography, something like that, and color accuracy is important to you, maybe Godox would be the winner for you personally. So moving on to the flash duration test, remember that we're kind of comparing apples and oranges here. Flash duration has a lot to do with the power output of the flash. And remember that these flashes do vary in power output. So it's not totally fair to compare, for example, the Profoto B10X to the Braun color when they're a stop and a half difference, but we're going to anyway. If we look at full power flashes only right here, there is one flash that destroys the competition. Look at this, the Godox 8602 at full power in freeze mode, one 2,470th of a second. That is unbelievable. You'll notice with every other flash, freeze mode at full power does almost nothing. There's almost no change at all between standard mode and freeze mode when it comes to flash duration except for the Godox. And you would expect if the Godox can go from one 200th of a second to one 2,400th of a second, there would be a massive shift in color, but there isn't. Somehow they have figured out how to get crazy flash duration while keeping the color consistent. And that's amazing. I've never tested a flash that can do that. Now, if you're looking for the fastest flash duration possible, you're gonna have to lower the power of the flash. And when we do that, you will notice that the Pro Photo lights become slightly faster than the Godox. So potentially you could say, if you want the fastest flash duration possible, Pro Photo is the winner. However, if you want a very fast flash duration at full power, there's no comparison at all. The Godox 8602 is the king. Now let's talk flash triggers. These are the remote controls that you're going to put on top of your camera and what's going to fire all of these strobes. And so in many cases, the user interface on these remotes is more important than the user interface on the lights because you're gonna be controlling the lights more often remotely than you will on the lights themselves. First up, the newer remote, it has a on switch on the side. I think I prefer the on switch. What I hate right off the bat with this remote and some of these others that we're gonna to get to, is that it has these buttons down the side that you can choose to jump to any of your groups of flashes. So you could put, you know, multiple flashes in group A, B, C, or D. And you're going to be jumping to like say C, and then you wanna change the power output. Okay, that makes sense. But what I hate is that these buttons aren't next to the actual letters on the screen. So you hit A, and it's like way above A on the screen, uh, and then E is like below where E is on the screen. It just seems like horrible design to me. And uh, you'll notice that there's a lot of these that have the same problem. So it kind of drives me crazy. These buttons down the bottom here correlate to what the screen says. Again, I just feel like this is very slow and 
what the bottom of the screen is saying is always changing. I just don't like it. I don't feel like it's super intuitive. It's not bad, but it's not great either. And the interesting thing is I never even got this remote to work. I don't think I was doing anything wrong. I tried this with multiple flashes. I could never get it to connect, even though I was putting on the right channel and the right group, it never worked for me. And so what I ended up having to do is I got one of my newer speed lights and I used this to do the wireless range test that we're gonna do next. The bottom line is I'm not a huge fan of this remote control. Next up, the Westcott FJX3S. I was really bummed out when I saw this remote and it didn't have the touchscreen that the Westcott Flash has built in. I thought for sure they were gonna have a touchscreen and it was gonna be super easy and intuitive. This one, it's okay. At least the buttons match where the letters are to the left. So that makes it a little bit easier to use. But you'll notice if I go through the menu here, I don't know if you can see this, but as I cycle, can you see how slow the screen is to refresh. Like you can actually watch the screen like refreshing in slow motion as you make these changes. It just doesn't feel like a modern piece of photography equipment. And uh, it bums me out again that they have the technology to make the super easy intuitive touchscreen. They put it on a freaking flash. So why wouldn't you make a remote that can do the same thing? I don't know. Next up, Godox X-Pro 2S. This remote has the same problems as the newer remote. The buttons do not line up with the uh, letters there. It's got this weird like Indiglo backlight, which I really don't like very much. And uh, again, these buttons down here correlate to what the screen says, and this is always changing. It just feels like a lot of buttons for no reason. And again, it's not bad. It just could be so much better. Well, luckily Godox got the memo and they made a remote that is so much better. Look at how small this thing is. And finally, they have created a touch screen remote control that you just click on what you want and you make the change. It's so much better. So this is gonna be hard to see just because it's so small, but basically I can touch and I can make changes to each one of the flashes in the group. I can press this button on the side to go to the menu here. I can go to settings right there. I can go to settings right there. And you can scroll around like that. It also has this crazy digital crown like an Apple watch. And if you don't wanna use your finger, you can rotate this as well. I feel like that's kind of overkill, but it's cool. They put it there and then you can press it in to make a selection. One other thing that I love about this remote control is that instead of having a locking mechanism to lock it on your hot shoe like all of these, and each one of them rotates a different direction, I hate it. This just has a button. So when you wanna take it off, you just push the button in and pull it off and it comes right off. I love that. Now, my only complaint with this remote control is that I feel like it's just a little bit too small. I know that's kind of a weird complaint, but being that you're going to be using this with your finger to make changes most of the time, sometimes I find that my finger's not hitting what I think it should. And if this was like double the size, the battery life could be better, the range could be better, the, the touch screen would be better and more accurate. So this is definitely my favorite remote that I've reviewed so far, by far. And it's really not even expensive, which is pretty impressive. So get this one if you shoot Godox for sure, but Godox in the future, just make it a little bit bigger. I think it'd be so much better. Next up, we have the Profoto remote. And uh, I really like this thing. I could definitely imagine it being better if they make this a touchscreen in the future. I like the size of this. I feel like this is the perfect size, but it's so freaking simple. You touch the letter of the group you want to change and you rotate the power output here. If you want to go into the menu, you simply press the middle button and you just go down and you press this button to make changes. It could not be easier. The little sun button here will turn the modeling light on and off and the auto button jumps between TTL and manual. It is so beautifully simple. There is no need to have all of these buttons and complexity. I don't understand why all of these have so many freaking buttons. There's no need for it. This is what a trigger should look like if it's going to have buttons. However, I think it would be even better if they made something this size that was just a full blown touchscreen. Now for the world's worst trigger, the Braun Color. Maybe this was awesome when it came out a long, long time ago, but man, this just feels like this should not be on the market anymore. Let me show you how this works. This is so crazy. Okay, it's not on, it's not on RF, so I gotta figure this out. So press that, go to sync, go to RF, 
think that's good. Maybe that's good. So we will now press this button. We'll make a change. And then to send the change over to this, we have to press the button again. How insane is this? It doesn't make the change until you, you send it over. Now I might be wrong, but I don't even know if this remote can do groups. I don't know if you can set like an A, B, and C group and change the, the output individually. If it does do that, it's gonna be the slowest possible process. So I can't even believe that this is on the market anymore. I honestly thought when I received this that I made a mistake and then I must've bought some old one and then there's gotta be a new one. I don't think so. I think this is what they sell. It's really bad. So now it's time for the range test. And each one of these flashes did pretty well in my initial test. The Braun color died first at 470 feet, which is quite far. Profoto died at 490. The newer died at 610. And remember, I wasn't able to get their trigger to work, so this is with me controlling it with another speed light. The Godox X3S, the little touchscreen one, it died at 630 feet. The Westcott died at 790 feet. And the Godox X Pro S, the older trigger, which I don't really like the layout, it had the longest range of 820 feet. For the second test, I put each trigger behind my back and I was in my car while I was doing this test. So each trigger had to fire through the seat, through me, through the front of the car, all the way to the flash. And the Pro Photo died quickly at just 60 feet. Braun Color went 180 feet. Westcott went 360 feet. The Godox X3S at 400 feet. The Godox X Pro S at 510 feet. And the newer, this was a shock. Again, remember, I'm firing this with a speed light. It had almost the exact same range. So it ended up winning this test at 560 feet. Now, just a couple of notes. As you know, we're reviewing multiple Godox and multiple Pro Photo lights. I tested all of them and I got the same range on both Pro Photo lights and all three Godox lights. And all of the triggers, except for Braun colors, has a short range and a long range option. And the Westcott is the only one I believe that's in a normal range option natively. So I tested Westcott both with normal and max range and I didn't see any improvement, um, which was a little strange, but I guess that's fine. You can just always shoot in normal mode and you're still gonna get great results. The reason that each one of these triggers has the option for short range and long range is because sometimes when you're shooting in the studio or a really tight environment, if the trigger is close to the flash, sometimes it won't fire when it's in a long range mode. So you might have to set the trigger to short range so that it can work when you're shooting indoors. That being said, Braun Color is the only option that doesn't have that setting. So let's uh, test it right now. All right, so Braun Color has no problem firing when it's close. Now let's talk about LED lights or constant lights or modeling lights. Each one of these flashes has one built in and I think they are super important. Not only can you use them as a modeling light to simply help you focus before you flash the picture, I like using them for video. I mean, if they're bright enough, why not? Here you can see each one of the lights with the LED at full power. I believe the two brightest are the newer and the Godox AD600 II. Both the AD600 II and both Profoto lights have the ability to color shift, but Profoto seems to have a little bit more range when it comes to that color shifting. This is something that I personally use all the time. Now, you're probably thinking that the AD600 II is the clear winner. It's the brightest and it also color shifts. That's true, but if you're gonna be recording video with these lights and you're gonna be recording audio, they need to be quiet. And I'm sorry to say that all three Godox lights, the second you turn on the modeling light, the fan comes on instantly and it's quite loud. Listen to this. I don't know if you can hear that. It's not horrible. And if it was behind a softbox, maybe it would be okay, but it's pretty loud. Now I could be wrong about this, but I believe I've read online that the Pro Photo lights actually have a thermometer inside and they will turn on a fan if they get hot. Whereas the Godox lights simply measure what you're doing. Like if you do 80 flash pops at full power or if you turn on the modeling light and it automatically turns the fan on whether it's hot or cold. You'll notice here when I turn on the modeling light here, I'm at full power. 
it is totally silent. There is no fan at all. It will eventually come on, but even when it does, it's still not on. It's very, very quiet. I'm gonna pop a few flashes and see if I can get it to uh, overheat. Okay, so I just heard the fan go and turn off. It's off again. Let me, let me fire a few more. There it goes. So when you get both of these going, they are pretty similar. I would say Profoto is slightly quieter and it's much slower to turn on. Now the test you've all been waiting for, the stress test. I moved all of these flashes to my tile bathroom floor because I was honestly nervous about catching this table on fire. I set them all to full power. I set my camera to automatically shoot every four seconds and I just started popping flashes. My bathroom was lighting up brighter than the surface of the sun and I just let it run. The first flashes to start giving up were all three Godox lights at 84 flash pops. One turned off, then the other, then the other. And I went back and looked in their manual and they tell you if you do 80 full power pops very quickly, it's going to put the flash into overheating mode and it's going to slow down how quickly it allows you to shoot. So as my camera is shooting every four seconds here, the Godox light starts giving out for every other shot, meaning that they're keeping up with every eight seconds. At 117 full power flash pops, the newer Q4 on the left over here, it gives out, but it's still going. It's just unable to keep up with uh, every four seconds. You can see it's like every other shot, it's doing the exact same thing. I don't recall noticing an overheating symbol on that flash, but it might be doing the exact same thing because it appears to be firing every other time. And can I say, it's just amazing that the Braun color, being the most powerful and the largest, has not given up yet. However, it is the next to go at 173 full power shots, which is quite impressive. And the Westcott and Profoto lights are still going strong at 230 flash pops. Westcott dies around 320 flash pops. The Profoto B10X dies at 331 flash pops. And the B10X is still going. But of course, remember it is the least powerful flash. And boom. All flashes dead at 393 flash pops. Now, when I went in to check the flashes, all of them were dead except for the Godox lights. They had like half their power left, but they just stopped firing. So there seems to be levels to their overheating protection. I'm not exactly sure what those numbers are, but like I said, the manual does warn you if you do over 80 full power flash pops, it's going to limit how quickly you can shoot. So let's do a quick wrap up here. We'll go through each one of these flashes from cheapest to most expensive. The newer Q4 is an unbelievable flash for $300. If you're just looking for something cheap, maybe you need a bunch of different flashes and you don't wanna spend a ton of money, you cannot go wrong by buying this flash. I don't think it was the clear winner in any one single category, but when you consider the price, I think this is the best value by far. The Westcott FJ400, great light as well. Again, for the money, I feel like it's a great value, although it's a little bit more expensive at $550. It's also significantly heavier as well. However, as you just saw, the battery life and flash output was significantly better than the newer. This flash was one of the most color accurate that we tested. It also had really good wireless range. I just wish that it was a little bit smaller, more compact, lighter, and I wish it had better navigation on its screen. The three Godox lights performed really well. I personally would no longer recommend the AD400 Pro when the 600 is out, and I feel like it gives you a little bit better performance for not much more money. And I would not recommend the AD600 Pro now that the AD600 Pro 2 is out. For just 100 bucks more, I think this light is definitely worth the upgrade, and I also really appreciate the color shiftable and brighter LED. Godox has the best wireless range. It has arguably the best wireless remote control. It also has by far the fastest flash duration at full power, if that's something that's important to you. If you're willing to spend more money for a slightly nicer product, Profoto might be the clear choice for you. I love how small and compact both of these lights are. I don't think there's much comparison at all when it comes to user interface. Using these lights is the easiest, most convenient, and these buttons feel so much better and higher quality than all of the other flashes. 
I think my only complaint with these flashes is the wireless system. The range just isn't nearly as good as the others that we tested. I know there's certain types of photographers, like architectural photographers, that might put a light like this outside to replicate the sun, and it may struggle to go through walls to actually fire, uh, whereas something like the Godox definitely will not. That being said, I've used Profoto for years, and wireless reliability has never been a problem for me personally. And finally, the big boy, the Broncolor Cirrus L. This is by far the biggest. It's by far the heaviest. It's by far the most expensive and it is the brightest. It's just not that much brighter than the other lights. And when you consider the user interface isn't very good, when you consider how horrible the wireless trigger is, when you consider that it's not really color accurate at all, I really feel like this light needs to be upgraded soon because this feels like an antique. It doesn't really feel like it should be on the market right now and therefore, I certainly cannot recommend it. Well guys, thanks for watching. You can click on all of the links below to go to each one of these products. You can also go to the full write-up on fstoppers.com to get even more information about each one of these tests that we did and each one of these flashes. And I imagine you're a professional photographer if you've lasted this long, and I want you to check out our photography contest, which we're running every single month. It's totally free to join. You can check it out at fstoppers.com slash contest. We are literally giving away thousands of dollars in prizes and there's no risk on your part. It takes seconds to upload an image. You could be featured in our next video and you could win thousands of dollars in prizes and it costs absolutely nothing for you. fstoppers.com slash contest is where to check it out. I'll see you next time, guys.